People want to do business with people that they like, and they get to like you when they're at a live event. And so to me, I've always said, if you can get out and network and go to a live event, that's where business takes place. That's where you're going to grow your business. That's where you're going to make uh, joint ventures. That's where you're going to do acquisitions. And I mean, that's where all the magic happens. Welcome to the Paid to Create podcast, where we dig into the secret strategies of successful creators making a lucrative living. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. I just have to tell you about Katra, the marketing platform that has seriously transformed my business. You know how running a business can be insanely time consuming, right? Well, Katra has been a game changer for me. It's honestly like having an entire marketing team in my pocket. And what I love most is that it automates all the tedious daily tasks for me, from marketing to sales to even customer experience. I can't believe how much time and energy I've saved since I started using it. And get this. With Kartra, I can create websites, funnels, courses, membership sites, email campaigns, calendars, surveys, you name it. It's made managing my business so much simpler and more affordable. Honestly, I can't recommend Kartra enough. If you're curious, head to paidcreatepodcast.com backslash Kartra to start your trial. Trust me, you won't regret it. Welcome everybody to today's episode of the Paid to Create podcast. I'm your host, AJ Roberts. Alongside me is Sarah Jenkins. And today's guest is Deanna Rogers. She has been in the industry for over 20 years um, and has had many businesses. Um, you know, she's been very successful in the event space and currently is partners with Ro Roland Fraser and Ryan Dyson in, in three amazing businesses. Um, and we'll get into more of that as we, we go through today. So Deanna, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, we're so glad you're here. So uh, I always like to ask kind of, you know, tell us your journey into entrepreneurship and business, because I know you've had kind of an up and down thing and, you know, things are popping now and, and you've got amazing partnerships and working with guys like Damian John and stuff like that. But I know it hasn't always been that way for you. So we always like to rewind a little bit and say, like, how did you get into this crazy world of entrepreneurship? Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so yeah, so my journey has been a fun one. I've uh, learned a lot over the last 20 years. Uh, basically, I was, I have always had businesses. I owned daycares when my kids were little. Uh, I actually had other like cosmetic stores, things like that, that were just normal businesses that I did. Um, but in 2000, I got diagnosed with cancer and had stage four cancer. So for about five years, I had to battle that and I had to like really figure out how did I really want to, you know, what did I want to do with my life? Like what was happening? And so I had three little boys that, that counted on me. And so uh, as soon as I was uh, able to, I, I was able to get into the event space. It was what I wanted. I always loved events. And so um, I, I started in Austin, Texas, and I created a company called uh, uh, AMG affiliate mastermind group. And I had a partner named Sheila and we started doing joint ventures and teaching people how to go do it, joint ventures and how to, um, do events and how to create an event space. And so we started doing that. And I did that for several years and that real estate space was mostly that area. Cause a lot of real estate agents were out there doing events and that's kind of how I got my feet wet. And, um, so I was doing events and running that and wrote a couple of books with Sheila and, and uh, came across Mr. Roland Frazier because Mr. Roland Frazier was speaking on stages. And um, he was speaking on several of the stages that I was uh, doing events for. And so got to know Roland very well in that event space. Um, then started doing some, some other things into like commercial events and just getting into different type of commercial real estate events and different other, uh, you know, groups of like we started doing masterminds and started doing um, events on, uh, at the time was what we call JV joint ventures, but it was strictly on how to go out and build your portfolio. So we were doing all these fun things, um, started my own events, my own mastermind. That was my first round to do that. Um, and invited Roland to come and speak at my mastermind. So my very first one was in Colorado and we had 200 people and Roland just blew the house up. It was amazing. And um, so that was really fun. And then I realized how much I loved it. I loved masterminds. I loved growing that space. And um, a couple of months later, Roland came to me and said, hey, I'm partnering uh, with Ryan Dice and uh, his partner. And uh, there's this little event called Traffic and Conversion Summit. You might enjoy that. <laughs> and I was, I was so intrigued. I was always my own business owner at that point. And I didn't really ever think about going to work for someone else. And Roland made the comment. He's like, well, you know, when you start feeling like you're an employee, you can leave. 
like, you know, I want you to come in. I want you to learn. I want you to grow. And I'd love to do this with you. And I had such a high respect for Roland Frazier. Um, and I could not turn that down because who would not want the opportunity? If you're in the event space, that was like this, the, the Super Bowl, right? And so that was fun for me. So I came on board and that's been 11 years ago in that space, working with uh, Ryan Dice and Roland Frazier in growing Traffic and Conversion Summit until they sold it a couple years ago. And um, and then, of course, uh, when we sold Traffic and Conversion Summit, Roland kind of started putting me under his wing and saying, okay, let's create an event company. Let's do events. Let's do all these fun things. Well, then COVID happened. It's amazing. You know, it's like shut down the world, no events. So, um, <laughs> so then we're like, well, what do you do? And because we were doing at the time, Roland and I were traveling probably 30 to 40 events a year. It was quite a bit. Um, and we had multiple masterminds and, and uh, live events. And so that shut things down. And Roland, as brilliant as he is, was, you know, spun up one of his other programs that he had done years before. We called it Leverage, Exit, Grow, and Scale. He spun it into what we call now Epic, Ethically Profit in Crisis. And started that as a challenge um, three years ago, right the month after the world shut down. And uh, I've been on that journey with him ever since. And then he allowed me to come in as a partner with him and do acquisitions as well in the Epic program and in the consulting for equity um, uh, business as well. And then we spun back up and rebranded the event space and created another event company called Evolve Events that Roland and I are partners on. So that kind of spun back up. So we we uh, worked together on many different levels, and then we had the pure joy of being able to just recently um, become partners with Damon John and was able to do the mastermind with him, and, and we're growing that partnership out. And so uh, very blessed that I was able to be involved in that as well. So long journey, hit a lot of uh, you know bumps along the road, but I always say that's what makes you stronger and makes you resilient and work harder. How in the world do you have books I don't know about you haven't told me about? Oh, my word, woman. <laughs> I'll, have to share, I'll have to share them with you. I admired you before. And then the cancer thing. And then you wrote a book. I was like, shoot, you've been busy. <laughs> now nope. you have three adult men that count on you for help with their lives and their little kids. So I, I love I love it. Thank you. Yeah, we. I mean, we love events too. We we go to quite a few masterminds, and um, you know, we always we say like, if we pick up one golden nugget, it usually pays for the whole year, you know. And so it's it's a different approach that we take, where it's like we're not going to uh, necessarily try to you know every single presentation take notes, you know, we pick and choose, but we always find that value. But a lot of people say, you know. And with the virtual, with growth of virtual, obviously with COVID shutting things down, you know, why go to events? Why go to live events? So why do you love events so much? Well, I will tell you there, I'm not disagreeing with virtual events because I think that they had a time and a place. And I think that they really uh, kept businesses going. They kept um, communities together when, sh when COVID shut things down. So I'm not against virtual events at all. And my company does do them. So I'm not saying anything against that. There is, but there is nothing quite like being in a room with other people and networking. And the thing about um, being in a room, whether you're going into the room to do a couple of sessions and take away that one thing, or you're there the whole time, you get to know people, you're networking. And what I have found, and I mean, Damon was a great you know, example of that. Uh, we work with Marcus Limonis on a, on a bigger level now on some things because of that. Um, and we have some other partnerships that are about to be announced because of part, you know, being in the room, being in the room is so important. What, you know, just being in proximity of people and networking. And here's the fun part. People don't get to know you like this on a screen. Now, obviously I know both of you. So our personalities can be shining in these, in these little zoom boxes, but it's hard to do that when you're just in a square, you know? And so, but when you're at a person, when you're, when you can go to the bar and talk, or you can go sit in a lounge and, and kind of share ideas, people want to do business with people that they like, and they get to like you when they're at a live event. And so to me, I've always said, if you can get out and network and go to a live event, that's where business takes place. That's where you're going to grow your business. That's where you're going to make uh, joint ventures. That's where you're going to do acquisitions. And I mean, that's where all the magic happens. I'm not saying it can't happen on virtual, but I'm just saying it's just 99% more when you're in the room with people. So that's why I love it is because it's growing our brands. We're getting more partnerships out of it. I learn from every single one 
that I'm even at the back of the room for, whether I'm working it or not. So I just love being in the presence of people and getting to know them and figuring out how can we play together in the future. Mm. I love that. And honestly, I will tell you the last event that we were at, um, we were in the room for most of the time, but some of the conversations we had uh, with a glass of wine after were some of the most business building conversations I've had in a long time. Super As they, valuable. And, and they always will. Because if once, you know, and I know you and I, we've all actually all three of us, we've been on a yacht together, right? So we've been on a yacht and gone out on trips and done amazing things. But what happens there? You bond with people, you get on that yacht with, with friends and, or maybe they're strangers, but you leave as friends, right? And all of a sudden you're like, man, I really like that couple. They're an amazing couple. Their business model is amazing. And you start connecting. And before you know it, six months later, you guys are doing business together, or you maybe have a partnership or you're promoting one another. Like that doesn't happen unless you're together and you get to know each other. So I think that's... That's why it's so important that that you get out there and you go to events and you network. And, and again, I always tell my team, don't just go straight back to your room. Like go, go network, go to the bar or go to, if you see they're having dinner functions in the restaurants, go out with people and, and really get to know one another. That That's the magic. Absolutely. I, I think that sometimes the networking can save an event too. You know, we've all been to those events right. that uh, aren't necessarily the best or the, or the speaker, you know, um, they may have amazing information, but they've never spoken before. And so they're kind of, it's a, it's a tough presentation to sit through. Um, and that networking some kind can save the event and make it a lot of fun. Um, you know, what are some of the biggest challenges you have when putting an event together or better said, like, you know, like what are some key components to making sure the event is good? You know, I, a couple of things. Um, you you hit one of them on the head. It's it's the making sure that you have really good speakers that are going to be, um, you know, geared to the topic, what the event is, and what what I've seen a lot of people do wrong is like, well, I saw so and so had these speakers, and so I should have my event. Well, is it applicable? Will they move the needle for the members of your event? You got to make sure that you know your audience, you know, know, know and understand what they're coming for. Why are they going to be at that event? And then making sure that the speakers apply, you know, and, and not just because they're a name brand, but because they can give content. To me, I would rather have 10 content speakers that blow it out of the park than one name brand. Now, again, a lot of people use name brand you know, speakers because, you know, it can drive traffic to, to sales and that's totally fine. But what people remember is the content, what they've learned, that one nugget, like you just said, I took that one nugget and went home and I w implemented it in my business. That's what people remember. And they'll come back over and over again because they're like, I need to go back and get that one more thing. Right. So content is king when it comes to planning your event. Like I tell people all the time, what, what are you going to deliver? What's your content? Like, they're like, oh, I want to do an event. I want to do this. Okay, well, what are you teaching? What are you going to do? What are you going to offer them at the event? So content is super, super. And you don't have to have it dialed in specifically when you're starting to plan right at first because you're going to get those little things as you go. But you got to have an idea of why you're putting on that event and what you want the members to get when they come to your event. So content is the number one. Number two is, is I always say this and people laugh, but I'm like, AV makes a big difference. Mm. It really does. You know, the experience in the room, whether, you know, I've seen people that, and I, I don't even want to say this, but like I've had seen people that have made it so cheap and they're like, I'm just going to do the little one pop-up screen for like 300 people in the room. So nobody can see the screen. Nobody can interact because they brought in their own pop-up and they don't have any sound and there's no mics and so, you know, I always say if you're going to do an event, invest in your event, make sure you have good quality sound, good quality AV so that your screens and projectors are good. People can see no matter where you are in the room and they feel like it's a great experience because if I'm sitting in the back of the room and I can't hear you and I can't see you, I'm going to leave. And how's that going to impact your event? How's that going to impact sales if you're selling anything, right? So it's so important that you tie all that together and make sure that they really feel like they're in the event. So that that that's where AV comes into play. Um, I'm a firm believer in having a really solid team around you. And I know that's so silly because people don't think of that, but personalities make such a big difference, you know? And to me, if you have the right team and they're willing to just work really hard and they're they're friendly and they make everyone at your event feel good, that's going to change the dynamics of your event. And so I've seen some people that put on event. I saw one recently that had over a thousand people in the event. Their team, I went as an attendee, their team was horrible. And I hate to say that they were just like, you. they were unapproachable, right? So I can just imagine 
sales were probably not that great. You didn't have a great experience, you know, and I've gone to another event that had, say, you know, a thousand people in it and the people were just amazing. They were warm, friendly, exciting. You just wanted to be there. You wanted, you wanted to be there every single day and come back. So, you know, again, there's those little things. Um, and then I always say the networking, figuring out how you're going to make your attendees network and whether it's, you know, offsite parties, receptions, whether it's excursions, if you're doing something in Mexico, are you going to go off and do fun things together? Like we've done that before where we, you know, we'll have like wine tasting or create your own whiskey or you going out, you know, and doing shopping excursions or whatever it is. But the bonding, like you said, is so important and that makes them want to come back. And again, if your event is based on sales or fulfillment and you're needing that, you got to think big picture of how's that going to draw everybody together? Why are they going to want to stay? Why are they going to want to follow you and come back again and again? So it's those experiences that you create at the event that from the AV, from your staff, from the content, from the excursions or the receptions, all of that is an experience. So creating that experience allows your attendee to just love you more and follow you and buy. Mm. That's what you do really, really well. You're very warm and outgoing and friendly. So I like coming to the event because I like to see you. I like to hang out with you and then I'll go learn something and it's really fun. But we were on the boat and I remember one of the most endearing, cutest things you said to me. I was like, hey, everyone's going to go jump in the water. You're going to you're going to get in. You're like, uh, oh, no, there are sharks in there. I was like, well, well yeah, it's the ocean. You're like, no, no, I don't go in their backyard. They don't come in my backyard. And then I didn't go in the water with everybody else. I just hung out with you. We talked about the the Damon partnership that you were excited to start up and you're like it's 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 starting it's gonna go well I'm like it's gonna go great because they have you on board and you are so buttoned up your events are perfect I'm very critical of events when I go I do notice if the speakers aren't as good if the mics aren't turned on properly if the on the screens you know if they have something flash up that's weird or doesn't quite fit the room I notice all that stuff because we're we're marketers we notice those things when we go to events doesn't mean I'm great at putting on events. That's why we like to work with people like you. But every event I've seen you do or work at is buttoned up and happy. And that was a big deal for me oh. is it was happy. Like I went to another event a long time ago and there was, we called him the door daddy. And we'd come in and be like, be like, you got your name tag? You got your name tag? And he's like, can you put your name tag on, please? And I'm like, no, thank you. And I just like walked in. I was like, what are you going to do? I paid to be there. But like, you're making me uncomfortable. <laughs> like, well, and I appreciate you saying that. And there's been times that we have not obviously hit the mark on it. You're never going to be perfect. But the one thing I will always tell my team and myself and I have to remember is that not everything will always be perfect. But then when you do make a mistake, own it and then just love on the people, you know, and make sure that you're, you're being very honest. That's my biggest thing is if, if we make a mistake, I'm going to own it and I'm going to apologize. And I'm going to make sure that the people in that room know that we're going to fix it. Like you that's overly fix it. That. When I was a yeah, sponsor, I always believe in that. We I made, always believe in that, you know, a shipping error or something. And you overly correct it. Hey, how about I do this for you? I was like, oh, that's very creative. I think I like that better than what we were going to do originally. So it worked well. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. you. You mentioned team and, uh, you know, you mentioned a lot that was re- really, really good. I think that the one thing I took away, you know, is like you kind of start, you have to start with a big picture, the big outcome, right? And it's, that's like any good marketing that you do, uh, you know, anything, any product you create or anything, there has to be a big takeaway right and so you know whether it's a one day event a two day event a three day event like what's the actual outcome like for the for the person attending like where are they today where do they want to be but you mentioned on obviously you've ran really large events you know we're not talking about tiny events here we're talking about you know a couple hundred people to thousands and thousands and thousands of people um which obviously takes a team and you know like you said you want your team to be positive but you know the the problem is they're dealing with sometimes uh, not the nicest attendees, right? There, there's all sorts of personalities that attend. Some people have certain expectations and, and you know, they uh, r- act in certain ways that aren't necessarily a proper. So how do you, how do you manage that team? How do you get them to buy into the vision of, of the event? Because sometimes obviously you're hiring people just for that event because it's such a large event. So maybe some tips there, because I know a lot of people that's like, just in general with business, like, building teams, managing teams is one of the hardest things for leaders to really master. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, I will tell you. So, you know, you could go to a small event, you could have three people or 10, you know, 10 staff members. I know the last year, a couple years ago, when we did our last, you know, when I was TNC doing the last one before we handed it over, um, the, I, if I remember the numbers correctly, 
Um, we had 278 people that worked that event. So that was a lot of people to manage, but you know, I will, I will not take credit for that. I'll, I'll tell you, I had an amazing team underneath me. And the one thing I had 27 contractors and my company still does. My company still has 27 contractors that we pull from. And they, a lot of them, I think about 20 of them have been with us since I came on board 10 years ago. Like they started with me with TNC. So they, they live and breathe it and they love it, right? But the, the key to that, to your team, is putting people in charge and giving them that ability to make uh, decisions and make them feel important and allow them that opportunity to grow. And so I always had key players and I had a management team, just like you would with any business. You know, you have your high management and then you have, you know, other managers and then those managers have, like, especially like for for that TNC event, I think we had over 220, 230 temps, right? That come from a temp agency. They're not going to have the same passion and love and feel that your employees or your contractors will because they're not going to feel that. But that was important was that the managers that each had 20, like let's say you had the manager that had 20 or 25 people, he or she was responsible for keeping that uh, vibe, that feel, that excitement. And the one thing that um, I would always commend the managers is like, go by and check on them, make sure that they have a bathroom break, you know, touch their shoulder and make sure they're okay and see if they need something and give them a positive affirmation. You're doing a great job standing there. I know standing on your feet is tough, but just, you're doing a great job being that door holder. Cause you know, I don't think they get that. If they're, if they're working in that space, they probably don't get that at all. And so you'd be surprised at how excited they are when they get just kudos, right? And then the one thing that I would do at the end of the day was, is I'd have the managers take them into a room and we'd have like, you know, a rally of like, okay, here was the end of day one. What does that look like? What are we doing for tomorrow? But it was more like, think of it from your high school days of pep rally. Like, you know, I was like, Ooh, it's we're getting excited. We're, you know, what are we doing? What did we do wrong? What are we gonna do better for tomorrow? And we really hyped them up. You know, it wasn't on all the bad things. It was all on, okay, well, we touched on the things that maybe didn't work. What are we going to do tomorrow to fix it? And then I would randomly make sure the managers picked people that earned awards that day. And it could just be a simple $10 Amazon card or a Starbucks card. Just, I mean, they're getting paid as well. Don't get me wrong. But just to reward them, just to let them know, thank you. Right. And that was something, believe it or not, it was something that I learned a long time ago when I went to a Salesforce event and I was watching. If any of y'all have ever been to a Salesforce, I'm a people watcher. I learn from watching people. If you ever see me, I watch. I see what everyone's doing. I'm the person that at the hotel is looking to see who the guy is that's, you know, doing the floors at two in the morning. I'll go up and ask that guy, Ooh, I Why that are, guy. How, long, how long have you been here? And I did that one time and he's like, I've been here 28 years. And I'm like, doing floors? And he was like, they treat me really well and I'm paid very well. And, he, and when he told me what he made, it's probably the most expensive person I've ever seen doing floors, right? Ever. But he was treated well and loved and respected, and he'd been there 28 years. And so Salesforce, I went, you know, one year, I've been a couple years, but this one year I remember particularly, I was just watching. It was people watching while my husband had gone to <clears throat> to some of the, the different um, sessions. And I watched the different managers, and the managers had different hats and different scarves. And they were walking around, and they were just giving kudos, and they were giving buttons. And if you've ever been to Salesforce, you have the lanyards with all the different buttons that you collect that all the members could have, but the team members had their own. And so as they saw things that they were, that they did, like maybe this person was super, you know, exciting and was helping other people, or maybe he went and picked up trash without even being prompted and was cleaning up areas, right? These managers in sections were going around and just saying, Hey, you did a great job. Here's a button. It's a button. It's a button that you put on your lanyard. Like it's not even, it may cost you 10 cents, but it made such a big deal that they were getting this recognition. And so I watched and I was like, that's so great. And you could see their face. You could see how they got excited that they were recognized and they earned that button. And then I asked him, I finally, after the guy left, I went up and I was like, how did you earn that button? I, I just need to know how you earned that button. And he was like, yeah, as you know, as the staff, if we earn these different buttons and we collect them, we get incentive pay or we'll get incentive trips or things at the end of this conference. When it's over, we get our name in the hats X amount of times based on how many buttons we have or whatever, and we can earn prizes. I was like, that's brilliant. This is awesome. And so I kind of just started incorporating things like that into how we manage people, you know, just because I do believe that if you 
give them attention and you, re- you respect them and you um, notice what they do, they will work harder. I've done things as little as little as maybe it's a staff of five and I know that they're going to be on their feet for 15 hour days. I've gone on Amazon and bought them Ugg house slippers that they can wear at the end of the day. It cost you a hundred bucks, right? But guess what it did? They all had matching Ugg slippers. They worked their tails off, worked their tails off and it was worth it, right? And so that lets them know that I appreciate them. So those are just little things, but I've learned it. It's not something I made up. I learned it from other people, but I just take that and I'm like, okay, I can apply that here. And I'm going to make sure that um, my team knows that, 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 that they're very much appreciated. And then that just kind of goes down. It trickles down, right? Because they're so happy to be in that position that they are good to the members. The members feel it as well. Mm. That's so cool. I actually do that in my business too with all the employees. I make sure they feel appreciated, spoken to, treated with equal respect. If it's, you know, I'm just as important as the customer service agent. I'm just as important as right. whoever is working with me, et cetera. But for me. I do struggle <laughs> with, <laughs> I do struggle with the criticism aspect as I don't like it. I hate criticizing. It like hurts my heart. I can't do it. I hate it. I can do it. It needs to be done. But man, what do you do when there's like a bad apple on your crew? And now we've done that. We've had them and we've had to remove them and we do it with love. And like, we're just going to feel like this is not a good fit. And this is probably not a, a fit for this event or a fit for this company or a fit for this program. Right. And, um, I, I, I you have to deal with it because you definitely don't one bad apple can actually run the hundred in the room, you know, and that's so important. And I've always been really, I've always, I tried to identify that and, you know, I've had to look at that and go, wow. And I've sent people home. I mean, at TNC a couple of years ago, I, saw one person that I thought was going to be a great person that I, I made a misjudge of character, got that person on site. And that person made some pretty poor choices of not being their best at their best. And so I just said, Hey, love you mean it, but we're going to put you on a flight tomorrow morning and let you go home early. Um, probably not a good fit to be working events with us. And, you know, it, it had nothing to do with that person's personality or that person's a great human. It just wasn't a good fit for that person to be working that event. And because I knew that if I allowed that person's behavior to continue, you'd have 100, 150 other people that are going to follow and see that and be like, that's okay to do that. And that just can't happen when you have that large of an event with that many employees. So you do have to, you have to, um, and you have to make sure that the team is aware of that. Like you have to be very candid and I, I don't do it meanly, but I'm very candid. We let someone go. They got on a flight this morning. So they're no longer going to be here because of the, some of the things that I saw. So please let me, I don't want to put anyone else on a plane tomorrow. Please understand that. And they all get it. They're like, oh, I don't, <laughs> don't want to do that. It's not mean. It's just letting them know, you know? So I think you have to do that. Oh, absolutely. Like you said, one one bad apple can turn into a hundred and it's that ripple effect, right? Like you don't know which attendee they speak to and you don't know that attendee's influence they have, you know, and you could have someone there like yourself attending an event who runs all these events and you're maybe thinking of this company as a partner or something like that or someone you may work with and that one person just ruins that whole thing. So you have to be very, you know, fast on that. Uh, obviously with events, like you have your team, um, you know, the person putting on the event, but there's so many other key players that go into running events, right? From the hotels that you're working with or conference centers to the vendors that are coming to, to the sponsors, to the speakers. And obviously the experience for each one of them matters because, you know, a lot of people will say yes the first time, but if it's not a great experience, they're not coming back. And as you mentioned, as events uh, kind of continue on year after year, they kind of snowball if they're good. You know, if you've been doing your event for five years and it's getting smaller, you're doing something wrong. So how do you ensure, because obviously it's a lot to manage, it's a lot it's like that, but how do you create an overall experience for every single person, including the attendee through to the speaker for an event? I mean, I think you just have to, like anything, you have to just dial it down. We, we, we actually sit with each of our clients and then we, we figure out like, what does that look like for the experience part of the speakers? Like, for example, we had one client that has an event in Costa Rica and we realized that it's an hour and a half drive for, for some of the keynote speakers. So we rented a helicopter so that they're there in 10 minutes, right? Instead of an hour and a half in a car. And so that experience changed how you know, a speaker feels about that event, right? Because that's a big deal to be able to 
go to an event in 10 minutes versus being an hour and a half in a car ride. So that was, you know, one thing that we've identified or, or from the members that are attendees in the room, you know, maybe it's seat drops and swag or, you know, making sure that there's coffee or smoothies, especially, um, you know, if there's like a health event, like we have one client that's very health, that very health conscious. And so there's just certain foods not allowed. And so making sure that those members all feel like they've got food that they can go eat and that it's, it's easily accessible. So that's maybe going to the hotel. And we've done this every year for this client. This hotel has to actually bring in new chefs and bring in outside food to fix for this client because there's certain foods that this group won't eat, you know? And so we create a whole new menu and bring chefs in and bring in different wine that doesn't have sugar and all these different things to make sure that those members are comfortable while they're there. And like sponsors, the other thing is, is we've done things with TNC over the years, um, a sponsor gifts every single day, like making sure we're going around and having someone. And we always had a team, you know, we had someone on our, our a group named Carrie and she was awesome. And we built a team around her and she, she'd get that team and they'd go around the room with their wagons and they'd give out gifts every single day and make sure that whether it's, can I bring you a coffee? Can I, I mean, it doesn't need to be something big, but it's just acknowledging how can I, how can I help you? What can I do to make this a better experience? And so I think identifying and then making sure you have team members, like, do you have a, do you have a speaker concierge? That person's just reaching out to the speakers and making sure they're happy. Do you have a sponsor concierge? Is that person just making sure that the sponsors are taken care of? Do you have um, um, what we call um, a ballroom concierge or ballroom manager? That person is doing nothing but making sure that the experience is well for the attendees in that room, right? So just little things that you have to just, and and we just break it down on a spreadsheet. It's, it's not rocket science, but it's truly identifying based on that client and based on their attendee avatar, how can we make this better? I mean, we've done it even for, um, we had one event, actually TNC was the same way. We had it at TNC where we had almost 200 members that, that um, came from Russia. So we wanted to truly make sure that we had headsets and we had um, someone translating so that those members were comfortable, right? So just identifying. Um, uh, the other thing that I, I would always suggest too is if you have anyone that's got AD, needs ADA support, right? Making sure that your event is ADA compliant and that anyone that may be hearing impaired, do they get seated at the front of the room? And you proactively do that. Like, don't make them wait to come and ask you. Like, you proactively go help those people um, that may need a little bit more love or a little bit more support so that they feel that. And that's going to make a huge difference in your event. Huge, huge difference. I didn't even think of that. We've got Karchal, ADA, and Weather and Jam all compliant and stuff, and it took a while to figure out that we needed to do that. And now it seems like that's just – an. It would, I would have not th thought of that at all. Yeah, it's just little things. And it's funny because we'll ask, we'll do a survey, is there anything that you have needs for? And, you know, and maybe they didn't fill it out, but maybe you see at registration that they are in a wheelchair or they have a leg brace and they've got a broken leg. Okay, making sure your team identifies immediately. Okay, we're going to go and you just walk up. We're going to make sure that you're comfortable. Would you like a seat up the front? Even maybe they're not VIP, but you're going to make them feel VIP. Because guess what? You want to make sure that they're comfortable. So I think just doing things like that changes the dynamics. And I'll tell you from the team member that's able to give that, they feel good about it. And so it's kind of reciprocal in that way. So I just love doing stuff like that. You yeah, really do. You're very good at it. <laughs> right. And I think that... Um as, you know, as, as those listening are, are will probably be starting to understand why you're so good at running events, right? And and it's that thought process through all of these different things. And oftentimes you forget, you know, um, you're like, oh, I'm going to run an event and I'm going to send an email to my members and we're going to get ticket signups and they're going to come and we're going to do this thing. And, but then you don't think through all of the little things. And I think that's why it's so important, um, you know, to, to work with people who do understand. Uh, events have changed a lot over the years. You know, it, it used to be, very easy to fill a room. Um, it, it's gotten harder, obviously. But what are some of the biggest changes that have happened in the events industry? And how do you put butts in seats consistently, um, you know, to have a successful event? Well, I think it's a couple of things. And it is a little bit harder. But again, if you're you're making sure the content is exactly what's needed for that for your attendees, for the people that would be coming to that event, gearing that, making sure um, 
that's one, making sure that, that you're communicating correctly. I've seen so many people that don't communicate well. They can put a ton of money into an event, but they're not sending the right emails or they're not marketing correctly. And that's just, that's huge. It's all about just how you communicate to your uh, potential attendees, right? Um, I've seen I've seen someone recently that uh, wanted to do a multi-thousand person event and waited until two months before to start emailing. Like, I... I can't, I don't know what to do. Like you have to have a plan. You have to strategically figure out like, you know, when you want to send those emails out, how you're communicating with them, making sure the content is going to be applicable. So why would they want to come? Why would I want to come to your event? Making sure that that's being shared. Um, I think also um, if you, if you need to bring in celebrity speakers, that always helps too. If you can, if that's a possibility for your event, because who doesn't want to go see that X, Y, Z? Who doesn't want to go see, you know, Damon John or Marcus Limonis or, you know, Richard Branson or some of the people that we've had. And so, you know, that's an exciting opportunity. People are like, man, I can go be in the room and hear that person, you know? And so I think there's things like that that you can do. It is harder to put butts in the seats, but what I will tell you, that's for your first event. But I'll tell you, if you do your first event, right? And you do an event over and over again, right every single time it's not hard to fill of an event mm. but you got to do it right and you got to make sure that when you're doing the event that you're making sure that your speakers are happy and that your attendees are happy and that your sponsors are happy that's the worst thing you can do is if you just like oh have your first event and then it just goes bad right they're not going to come back your sponsors are not going to come back your attendees aren't going to come back your speakers will talk badly about you so that first event you have to do well and make sure that 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 you're communicating to all of them and you're setting expectations, that's important. If you say it, you do it. I can tell you how many people put stuff out there and say, we're gonna do that, and then they don't do that. Mm. So don't do that, right? Like if you say it and you sell it that way, you better do it. Like be true to your word, um, be true with numbers. I can't even tell you how many times I get, I just cringe when people are telling me that I'm gonna have X, Y, Z at my event. And then you're like, but, no, but really how many people are you gonna, because I'll tell you from a sponsor's point of view, that makes a big difference, right? And if they think that there's gonna be 2,000 and there's 200, that sponsor is never gonna come back again. So being honest with everyone and being true to your numbers, and then you know it'll make a big difference. But if you do your event right every single year, it's gonna grow and grow and grow. It's not that hard to put butts in seats because it people will talk and people will come the next year. And that's the thing would be at the end of your event, is making sure that there's a call to action to get next year's event. Like that's so important that you do that, right? So you get the next year's event. I We have a client right now that started at a hundred and something, 150 people three years ago. His event is amazing, amazing. It's in it's in the bookkeeping space and his group is amazing. He's, he's sold out at almost 700 right now. It's his third, this will be his third year. They come in because he puts on an amazing event and an amazing experience, and the content is king. It's it's incredible content. They leave with things that they actually can go back and change their business with. So it'll grow, and I guarantee you by next year he'll be over a thousand. I guarantee you the next year he'll probably be two thousand. Like I know just from watching him grow. So I think that's really important that that you do that. And then, you know, one thing that I don't know that we chatted about. Maybe you're going to ask me, but. You know, it's figuring out how to monetize the event. I think a lot of people don't really, they're like, I want to do an event. That's great. What are you going to do with it? And how are you going to pay for it? And what's that look like? You know, and making sure that if you are going to, it could be if you're, if it's fulfillment, that's fine. If it's a complete fulfillment event, and we have quite a few of those, that's totally okay. Just knowing that you're going to spend X amount of dollars and you're going to have an amazing event. That's fantastic. But if you're wanting to sell, like you're going to sell a mastermind or sell your product or service or something like that, then you need to make sure that you have that plan of action. And one of the things that I think a lot of people fail to do at an event is plan. Planning is key. They'll be like the two days before, well, we probably should sell something at an event. Probably should think about that two, before two days before your event. And then they throw something together and it's not done well, right? So one thing I always try to really encourage any of our clients that we work with um, is is plan. Make sure you're planning and when then executing the plan. Whatever you're going to do, make sure that you do that. And I, I was at an event recently where I just, I saw it and they had a sales booth and they were going to sell masterminds and 
there was no one in the booth. No one. No one selling. No one. And then I, I happened to ask this person. I was like, well, how did you do? And and they were like, well, we did really bad at sales. And I'm like, <laughs> I walked by for three days and there was no one in the sales booth. So pretty sure you probably did bad because there was no one in the sales booth at all, ever, you know, and I purposely looked. And so, um, you know, just strategically making sure if you're doing it and you have a plan that you follow the plan and your whole team knows the plan. So that way you execute and that you do sales correctly. So that way you can actually monetize that event. So basically it has to be perfect, no pressure. And, (laughs) but do you help your clients plan for it? Do you help them walk through all of those steps and questions and things like, have you thought about this? Or, you know, if we, if we look into set out an email for our event, if you're going to be like, Hey, we should send that maybe earlier, you know, do you help your clients with those sort of strategic moves? Sometimes like now marketing, I don't get into really big into marketing, but I have an opinion on a lot of it. So I'm happy to talk to, you know, customers and clients about like what I've seen or what I've not seen work. Um, so I'm happy to do that, but I'm more in the logistics and the strategic planning, but yes, that's kind of what I love to do. I love to be able to look at the picture and paint it and be like, okay, how do we make this beautiful and figure it all out? Like that's, it's like a puzzle to me and I love that part of it. So uh, I have a team that dots the I's and crosses the T's and they're really good at that. I'm the person that likes to look at it and go, okay, how do we strategically make this a really fun puzzle and and execute it? So that that's the part that I like to do. Yeah. You know, it's interesting when you talk about first events, because I think everybody like thinks, oh, I'm going to have this massive event for their first event. Um, you know, you mentioned some key things there in terms of, you know, uh, planning ahead of time, you know, making sure you give yourself appropriate, um, you know, marketing, uh, you know, you, you know, uh, time to, to sell the tickets, making sure you have a plan in terms of, you know, what you're selling and how is it going to run and all those things. But, you know, for someone thinking about running their first event, what, what would you say are kind of some of the, the biggest mistakes that you've seen? people make that leads to you know that first event being such a bad experience that there isn't a second event (laughs) well i can tell you from experience what i've seen is people try to go too big too fast and um i always tell people it's okay to start small it's okay to sell out there is something to be said about having a sold out event and i'm just gonna say that like it's okay you know um you might say I really want to have a 500 person event on my first one. But if you can't really fill it with 500, why would you do that? It would be better to go in and say, let's do a 200 or do a 100 and sell out that first year. And then next year, because you know the interest level or you know um, how attendees are going to react or what they buy or however their demeanor is, you know what to plan for the following year. And so now that you've got sold out tickets, you're going to like, well, buy next year's ticket. And they, they do, they buy because they know it's been sold out. So that's huge where you got to realize hotels right now, since COVID, um, we are seeing a three to four X jump in cost from hotels, event centers, um, I hate to say it, but AV teams, everything, the costs have jumped through the roof because they're all trying to make their money back from the from the time that they were without business. And um, so going into an event space or a hotel, uh, what could have been a 30,000, let's say 30,000 F&B four years ago is now almost 100, if not more. It's ridiculous how expensive things are. So again... It, planning is is so important because if I were to go to a hotel or an event center and say I want space for 500, when really you really could have done it with two, that number is dra- dramatic, uh, dramatically going to change on what they charge you as a client from the hotel and AV because of the fact of the numbers. So I would rather go in and say 200 is my real number. And then if we grow and we do sell out, maybe beg for mercy and see if they have more space and grow that way or just sell out versus being locked into a contract with hotel space and AV and all of that for a 500,000 person event. And now you're locked into that, but maybe you only got 200 in the room. One, that looks horrible when you have a big space and then there's only 200 people. And then two, you probably went out and probably marketed to sponsors and sponsors think there's a thousand because you said that. And then there's 200. So now your sponsors are mad, right? And then you went out and booked this thousand space, 
guess what? You spent a ton of money with Hotel Navy, but guess what? You have 200 and you probably could have got it for a fourth of the cost, right? So I always say be true to your number, be realistic, figure out what is a real number and then book it on that. And then if there's opportunity to grow, fantastic. But just, I think people just think of a number. I would rather have 200 people in the room that are solid than to have a thousand of people that you just threw butts in a seat. That that's not going to matter. So I think just being real to your numbers and and really truly um, figuring out what is going to fit for your budget. That's so important. Is that you have an event budget before you do anything? Like no, and I know Sarah, you're amazing at this because you already knew when you and I chatted. You knew what your budget was. A lot of people don't know that. They're like, I don't know. And then you start throwing numbers out there and they 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 wig out because they don't understand what the numbers are. So knowing what your budget is and then going backwards and planning based on what you feel comfortable spending, then doing that and then making that event happen. Oh, man. I, I always say that to my staff and people I work with. I'm like, I don't like surprises. Do not surprise me. This is the number. This is the number you said it's going to be. It better not change. <laughs> so right. I'm very strict with it because I like I like keeping my finances tight. <laughs> it's helpful. Well, and it's important because the whole thing, you know, the, the thing about hotels is that they are jumping their prices up. They're charging 30 to 35 percent plus plus fees on top of all that your av expenses are higher so you know again what could have been a hundred thousand person event four years ago is now three four hundred thousand dollars for the same event so it's just it's more important now than ever to be really tight on your exact numbers and your exact budget and really uh, gauge what you really want for that event yeah what about um hidden costs that show up and surprise people Aren't those the best? You gotta love those. <laughs> those are so fun. Uh, you know, I I always try to build in when I'm doing the budget a little bit of that. So kind of, um, you kind of know when you've been doing it for a while, like what to expect. So like I always know, like okay, with AV, I'm gonna build in a budget of this just in case there's this. So there's a buffer, right? So maybe they did a quote of this, but then there's a buffer of this. Hotel. Oh my gosh. Uh, I always build in 35. I mean, uh, I can't even tell you, dear Lord, 35%. I just mark it up because you never know. And they generally are 30%, but I bump it up by another 5% because let's just say, you know, um, it's, it's interesting to me. You look, I had a client recently that had a hundred thousand dollar food and beverage. And so, and I kept telling that they, well, actually I say this wrong. They were a friend of mine. They weren't a client. And I was doing them, a, I was doing a favor. And so they had reached out and asked me some help, but they were doing something and I gave them some advice and they had a hundred thousand food and beverage. And I kept telling this person, I was like, make sure your budget is really good. I don't mind jump, jumping in and helping, but let me know. And, um, that person came back and was like, can you believe that my bill for food and beverage was $140,000 when it was all said and done? I'm like, do you mind sharing and let me see what that is? I'm pretty sure I know what it is, but let me see. Sure enough, it was the 33% plus plus, and then they'd gone over on some things. But your budget, she had put in her budget, black and white, 100,000, when really she should have been 140 or 130 if you were doing that right, you know? So I always try to put a buffer there. That way, if you go under, it's like a surprise. You're like, yes, I got money. But if you don't, you're kind of spot on and you're you're pretty close. Um, the other the point where I've seen people make um, big mistakes um, is, again, you did not plan correctly. So you got excited and said, I'm going to do a thousand person event or I'm going to do a hundred, whatever the number is. But really, you only put half of the people in that room. And then half of those people decided they wanted to bunk up with one another. And so or they wanted to go get an Airbnb. And so therefore, they did not get all of the rooms. And so now you are stuck with attrition for hotel rooms. I cannot tell you how bad that can be. <clears throat> so the one thing that I always try to encourage a client is, is only do 50% of whatever you think your attendees are. When you're contracting with a hotel, if you think you're going to have 200 people, you tell the hotel there's going to be 100 with maybe, maybe 75 rooms. So even go a little bit lower than 50%, right? Because you can always ask for more. Hotels will always give you more rooms if they have it, um, or you can go get other hotels nearby. But what you don't want to do is then all of a sudden be stuck with a hundred rooms that you now are paying for that are sitting empty. And now your budget is blown out of the water because you just didn't, you know, I've seen people do that. They're like, I have 200 people. So I'm gonna get 200 rooms. No, no, don't do that. Like 
you know, go, dial it back and then ask for more later. So those things can be very painful because I've seen people eat. I saw somebody last year that ate $120,000 in cost of rooms that sat empty. I could have gone around and given out free rooms to everybody and it would have been a party. Um, but that, you know, it just, it was unfortunate. Um, there were some things in play of why that happened, but that was unfortunate for that, that person. Um, so I always try to tell people, you know, be very careful with your numbers. Mm. I think that's, that's super important. Uh, I think people don't pay attention to numbers enough and, you know, Talking to numbers, what are some success KPIs or uh, metrics that you measure to know that event has been successful? Because I imagine some of the events you've done and the scale you've done them immediately after the event, maybe there wasn't the ROI, but you know, over the next 12 months, over the next 24 months, you're going to make profit, right? And, 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 and uh, so what are some of those metrics that you measure to say like, you know, this event was successful, or, you know, or it wasn't as good as it could be. We need to change some things. Well, that's really hard to answer because it depends on the client and it mm. depends on why they're there in the room, right? So like, for example, if if it was a fulfillment event and they're there for um, a product or service, um, like they're in there for, let's say they're there for bookkeeping, but they're not really selling anything. So maybe they didn't make a lot of money on the back end of that, but you did a survey and 94% of them re, you know, uh, re-enrolled for the service for another year because they were at that event. That's a success, right? Because now they're, they're engaged and they're staying engaged. And so things like that, that we do pay attention to just to see, we also were very big on MPS scores. So sending out a net promoter score right after the event to get feedback from people just to see what, what they loved and what they didn't love. Um, and I always tell people, tell us what you didn't love. Like, we can only make this event better if you tell us the bad too. And I think that's also what people, um, they're fearful of. They don't like negativity, which is, I understand. But the one thing I always tell people is, if they tell you, and you're always going to get the negative first, because the unhappy person always writes first before the happy person does. It always happens, right? So you're always going to get that negative first. But if you can learn from that negative or you can spin that into something, then I always say that's a positive. Like, you know, maybe uh, maybe it was pouring down rain for three days. There's nothing you could control about that. So it ruined the parties. And so maybe all the negative comments were because the parties were ruined. Well, OK, but that's not necessarily the conference was ruined. Right. So kind of just really making sure that you understand um, what made people happy. I, one of the things I always look for, too, is is social media. Uh, seeing how many people are posting on social media. How's our reach going out after an event? Like how many people are sharing that event? That's huge. Cause guess what? That's going to help you with promoting for the next year. You know, that's, that's a big one. Um, and if it is sales, um, it, it, that's always a great KPI of, you know, whether you sell them into a product service or a mastermind, that's always great, but maybe they didn't all buy, but maybe they opted in for a follow-up sequence or something like that. So they're going to be, uh, following along on the, the customer journey. So that's important um, just to know um, because I always track back. Like generally I'll say, okay, from your attendees six months later, how many converted? Because maybe they didn't convert during those three days of the event, but maybe they went back and two months later they bought, they bought the mastermind. It's good to know those numbers. It's always good to be able to track that back and say, wow, they, they did, they attended the event and now they're in the mastermind. Man, it took a little bit. That's okay. They're still in. They 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 bought. They dated with you. I always say they date, right? You know, they may not just marry you right away. They want to date before they marry you. So that's okay. So just knowing your numbers. And then um I guess the other thing would just be um obviously I always said the NPS. That's a huge thing for me. Um I this is not a money maker needle, but to me, I always want to know the response of sponsors. Um, and the reason being is, is I value a sponsor so much because they are the backbone of the business of that event, more so than you ever will realize. They help pretty much generally. If you have sponsors, they generally pay for that event. And most people, when they set up sponsors, the reason being they have sponsors is to defray the cost of the event. And where I feel a lot of people make mistakes is they don't value their sponsors. I've seen people they're like, ah, they're a sponsor. They put them on a the table in the back and they don't care. They never do anything with them, ever. 
<clears throat> that's such a bad experience. And I'm the opposite. I love sponsors. Like to me, <clears throat> they become my friends and I want to know the good, the bad, the ugly, Sarah, you're not happy. Tell me, how can I fix it? <clears throat> I reason- tell you nicely. <laughs> no, you will. And, and, and I want to know that. Right. And it's not I me. Mean, my, I don't want to know just because I want my feelings to not be hurt. I want to know so I can make it better. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that's the key is, is understanding your sponsors and their pain points and what did they see and getting their feedback. Cause again, they're the ones watching. They're the ones getting the feedback from people in the room or from outside in the foyer. So knowing that, and if you are going around that room and you're getting sponsors to renew for the next year, and let's say you had 10 sponsors and you get 80%, you get eight of them to renew for the next year, I think you've done a really good job. That's huge, right? So uh, that's a big needle mover for me is just knowing that the sponsors are happy, they're renewing, they're coming back, they're going to support us, they're going to support next year's event. And that's just, that's a personal win that I tell people all the time, like, you make sure those sponsors are, are front and center, that you love on them. Yeah, yeah, I'd love that because, well, I used to run a big event and that was something we added in and we noticed a big difference too. We added in a sponsored dinner before the event. So the night before the event of a sponsored dinner and kind of did Q&A and, and like answered questions for them and said, you know, like, how can we help you? Like, and that was really, really cool. It was, it was more like a mastermind dinner, you know, because like everybody yeah. was going around and, and so that was really cool. And then daily checking in, at, you know, at the end of the day, checking in with them and say, how did they go, you know, and sharing ideas with them too, you know, like, oh, well, this is isn't really happening. Well, have you thought about doing this, you know, capturing leads versus trying to sell the product and stuff like that. And so, you know, because I think that, uh, you know, as a sponsor, one of the mistakes sponsors make too, is they go with a game plan and, you know, they're there for three days, but after day one, it's not going to plan and they don't change the game plan. Right. And it's like, you know, so when you, when you have someone from the event, you know, who's putting it on, giving you feedback and, and kind of maybe giving you more advice, you could, you can save that event. And that's a big thing because, you know, People go to events for different reasons. People sponsor events for different reasons. And some people are there for brand awareness. So, you know, making money at the event is is not something they're looking to do. Other people are there because they think that that event is a launch pad for them, you know. And so they're measuring their success of that event as, you know, how many signups do we get or something like that. And so if you know the difference with those, just like you've mentioned earlier about knowing what each person needs to create the unique experience, you know, that's the same that with sponsors and then, you know, doing things to create that experience during the event, because for them, they're there the whole time. And like you said, they're just usually sitting at the back of the room or in a hallway. And, you know, if they happen to be in a spot that traffic doesn't necessarily flow through, well, is there something you could do to get traffic to go to them? Can you come up with stuff on the fly? And I know you're very, very good at that. You've done that for before. Yeah. We've, for us. we've done that. We've done that before for other clients. And, you know, going back to what you were just saying, I think it's all about communication. So, you know, one of the things that we try to do with sponsors, if we can, depending on the client, is I always encourage is to have like a like a webinar or a Zoom with the sponsors before that event happens and have live Q&A. Like, what is it? And get to know, especially if you have a smaller event, let's just say there's 10 sponsors. It's not that hard to get to know 10 people, right? And so getting to know, like, what, what do you want? What is, what's going to be a... The, what's going to be the the ROI for you? How can I help you get to that ROI? What's your pain point? What do you love? What do you hate? And, you know, and I make notes like, okay, this person doesn't like this. All right. Good to know. Like, right. Or this person loves this and, and this will be good to know as well. And we've done that. Um, and then after the event, doing another follow-up Zoom or webinar and getting them back on and going, okay, what worked, what didn't. And they'll be honest with you. They'll tell you right? They'll be like, well, I hated this or I didn't like this or whatever for that reason. And so you can fix it. And it's also allows them to be heard, right? That's the biggest thing is they just want to be able to talk about it. But then because you've done these things and you've built this relationship with them, going by every day and checking in on your sponsors and saying, Hey, how you doing? How can I help? We've identified before, you know, we had someone that picked a booth and it was behind a pillar. That person picked the booth. That person was adamant, but they weren't getting any you know, flow of traffic because they picked the booth there by a pillar. And we tried to tell them that, but they liked it because on the floor plan, it looked really great. Um, But then when we were on site, we realized that person wasn't doing well. And you could tell the demeanor of their personality. They were, their hands were crossed. They were not happy. And we identified that. And, you know, that person was a pretty high dollar sponsor. And so what we did is we went to the hotel and got $1,500 worth of popcorn uh, and rented a popcorn machine put the popcorn machine in that sponsor's booth. And guess what? That sponsor was so happy. Like, cause what, what is it? Popcorn smells. 
people go where they smell popcorn. So everyone went to that person's booth um, because of the popcorn. (laughs) And yeah, and then guess what happened? That sponsor was ecstatic. And I can tell you right now that sponsor, eight years later, that sponsor sends me more sponsors to this day. That sponsor will text me and say, hey, I was at another show and this sponsor should be at your shows. To this day, eight years later, I'm really good friends with that sponsor and we text. Now that could have gone south had I said, dude, I'm sorry, you picked the spot. That was your call and then just leave it. But instead, identifying and making sure that I, I saw and, and other people saw it as well. And then fixing it. And yeah, it cost us 1500 bucks, but I can promise you if I did the math of how much this person sponsored over the years, pretty sure I got my $1,500 worth. <laughs> Absolutely. It's the, it's the attention to detail. And I think that like, this is what, as we've interviewed different people, it's as you know, we have conversations at events and network and things like that. Those that are successful go above and beyond always, right? They're always looking for how do we make this better for everybody? How do we, you know, it, it's that, it's that give first, get later. And it's like, no act is unselfish. Like you said, that 1500, that, that, that $1,500 has turned into, you know, years and years and years of support. Um, and I think that that's one of the things that most people like when they're when they're looking, whether it's an event or a business, whatever it is. Those are the things that kind of you know are unmeasurable in a sense of like, what is this going to do for me right now? You know, and a lot of people will see it as a cost, like, oh, that was another fifteen hundred dollars we spent. But when you look at it as an investment and you say this could turn into something, we don't know what, but like it's probably going to be better than the other way, which is we know we're going to lose this person forever, right? And I think that that in business is something that a lot of people need to start thinking about is is how do we how do we think long term and what do we do today that actually has that impact like you said if you're running a first event you shouldn't be thinking of the first like just the first event you should be thinking okay if i'm going to do this for another 10 20 years what is that first experience going to be like so that they never want to miss it right and i think that that kind of zoom out thinking big that you mentioned early on that most people with their event they don't do in the beginning that's kind of like, you know, what is the theme for this event? What is the expectations we're going to set? And how are we going to over deliver constantly so that, you know, when people come to this, like they are going to be like, this was the best thing I ever attended. And, you know, like you said, it's never going to be perfect. And I think you have to be okay with that. Is there anything else for those that are thinking about running events or something like that? Is there anything else you, you, you haven't shared that you think is, is very important that we should, we should share today? You know, I would just say do your homework. Again, be like Sarah. Have your budget defined before you start talking to people. I mean, honestly, Sarah has got it dialed in from the moment I talked with her about an event. She knew. She knew her numbers. Like, that was so important. I talk to people all the time that don't. They don't know the numbers. And so it's just really hard to to really get that. For someone, Sarah knew. She knew what her number was. She's She's got it. And that's so important. So if you can go into an event an idea of an event and you know your number, you know your budget, you know what your outcome that you want is, you're going to do so much better. Again, um, surrounding yourself with a team that's going to be like-minded like you, that supports you. And again, sometimes you're not always a fit. I mean, we've not been, we're not perfect. We're not going to be the best fit for every single client. And we've had that and we we acknowledge that, you know, Um, but we will always try our best. And so I think that you have to find the people that fit your your energy, your level of what you want. And so um, I I think that's important. I mean, you're not going to have someone that's very religious, have somebody that's going to have someone that's at the bar drinking all the time, running their event. Like, you know what I mean? Like figure out who, who's working with who. And so making sure that you have the team that's the right fit for you. I always say identifying that. And then, you know, honestly, just what is the true outcome of your event? Like, what do you want out of it? If it's just because you're like, I just want to do an event and put that hat on and say, I did it, or I want a fulfillment for my clients because we owe that to them over the last couple of years, then that's fantastic. Or if you're like, I want to create a mastermind and then identifying that, then that's great too. But just knowing what you truly want so that way, whoever your team is, and I got to tell you, there's some amazing, I mean, I love my team, but there's amazing event companies out there. There's so many of them. You can find event companies that will support you. And I want you to go find those people that will help you and um, identify how to make sure your budget, make sure your team, make sure you have an experience for your people, and then tracking the data and making sure that your event is successful, however you measure that success. You know, I think that's super important. And then again, I always try to say, don't be stressed. Don't let this stress you. 
you know, an event should be fun. Event should be your Super Bowl, no matter if it's a 50 person Super Bowl or a 10,000 person Super Bowl, it should be fun. So the minute that it becomes a job, you'll never want to do it again. You'll, you'll hate it so much. You'll never do another event. So make it fun for you, for your team. Cause if your team isn't having fun, they're going to hate you, hate it. They're going to hate everything about it. Um, so making it fun. So I just, those are things I would do if I were you looking for an event. And then obviously, um, I do use companies out there that source hotels. I do that myself. I have companies. I do recommend that you use outside companies if you can, um, versus going direct. And the only reason why I say that is, um, not to dog on hotels or event companies, but, or event, uh, you know, facilities, but, uh, if they know that you're a one man shop, they will jack the prices up really high. And, uh, the language in their contracts are a lot different than if you're going with a company that knows what to read into a contract or knows what to put uh, as clauses into your contract. That's so important. I can't even tell you. So I will tell you this COVID happened. I had 34 contracts out. I did not pay a penalty on one single contract for COVID. Every contract that I had was either moved or canceled because of the because of the fact that I had clauses in my contract that protected our company. And so that's important. I saw some other friends that lost their shirts because they didn't have, you know, clauses in their contracts. So looking at things like that and I, you know, surrounding yourself with people that can go out and help you get the things that you need whether it's hotel contracts or you know, whatever that is, getting the right people on your team to help support you is really, really important. Mm, very good. So this has been one of the, the best podcasts we've done. And honestly, it's like, I see, I see why people like you need to exist, you know, to help people like us put on the events. You know, we have, we have all these grandiose ideas, but it's all the little things that make the difference. It's what's going to make the event successful. So for those listening, where can they find more about you and your companies and things like that? They can go to one, they can go to evolveevents.com. We got evolveeventsgroup.com. Uh, That's our website. You also, if you're looking more, we have um, Roland Frazier and I are partners in a company called Epic and we do business acquisition. So you can go to epicnetwork.com. You can find me in either place, um, but my company is called Evolve Events and we're excited to, even if you just want to chat a little bit about an event or something like that, I'm happy to chat with you. I, As you know, I can talk forever. So I'm a chatter. Love it. No, it's so much fun. It's been amazing. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks for the listeners for listening. And we'll see you on the next episode. I just have to tell you about Katra, the marketing platform that has seriously transformed my business. You know how running a business can be insanely time consuming, right? Well, Katra has been a game changer for me. It's honestly like having an entire marketing team in my pocket. And what I love most is that it automates all the tedious daily tasks for me, from marketing to sales to even customer experience. I can't believe how much time and energy I've saved since I started using it. And get this, with Kartra, I can create websites, funnels, courses, membership sites, email campaigns, calendars, surveys, you name it. It's made managing my business so much simpler and more affordable. Honestly, I can't recommend Kartra enough. If you're curious, head to paidcreatepodcast.com backslash Kartra to start your trial. Trust me, you won't regret it.